We're here again for another episode of People on the Move, broadcasting from the Virginia Maritime Association's VMA 2023. I have our guest Pete Mento with DSV. Pete, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. So DSV, one of the major freight forwarders in the world. Uh, I, we've done a lot of work with you guys over, over time. You have a lot of different commodities you deal with. So you're probably the best person to answer this question. From a freight, freight forwarder's perspective, Tell us what's going on in the market. It's changed a lot over the last three years, uh, pre-pandemic, during the pandemic, post-pandemic. Where are we settling out right now? There's a lot of pressure on rates, as you know. And the customer base has become more demanding than ever. So if it's not having expectations about technology or having expectation about rates, it's expectations about service. As they learn more and more about how technology can give them insights into what we do for business, they've continued to commoditize what we do. So they've stripped out more and more value. And that was going on from the middle of the 2000s. So now we find ourselves in 2023 on the cusp of 2024, we're seeing a dramatic shift back. As they've gone through the pandemic and seen how that affected their business, they're coming back to us trying to find ways to depend on us on everything from understanding what's next in economic waves, trying to understand from regulatory perspectives how that's going to affect their business, leaning on us for technology, leaning for us on being more predictive, and trying to find ways to use either the power of a large network or even a small one to get more out of their business and more out of forwarding. It's been interesting. You know, one, one thing that I, I've noticed um, the issue of getting on ships during the pandemic was because of congestion. At the, yeah. the ship could only hold five pounds of cargo or try to put 10 pounds of cargo on the ship, right? Mm -hmm. You had a lot of that with, throughout the pipeline. Today, you have a similar issue, but the difference is blank sailings. Yeah. In the month of October, 50 blank sailings, over 500,000 TEUs, and that's just coming to Trans-Pacific to the U.S. West Coast. Talk a little bit about that challenge because you're dealing with some of the same issues of trying to get your customers freight from origin to destination, but navigating a market from, there's a long line to get on it and how do I get on it? And sometimes it was just get out the checkbook and they'll put you at the front of the line. Now it's, we don't know if we wanna sail. So talk about that dynamic because that's gotta be difficult. So it goes back to relationships and it goes back to the strength of the contract. What have you negotiated? Who have you negotiated it with? Do you pay on time? Boy, is that big. Uh, who are you working with and what kind of a, of a strong and strong, strong relationship have they built with the carriers? I, I can't stress enough. Are you a partner with a carrier or do you have a transactional relationship? So at, at DSV, we've done everything that we believe we can to build long term, decades and decades long relationships with these carriers in order to serve our clients. And then the BCOs do the same thing. They found themselves at a crossroads once the pandemic ended, do you go back into those contracts looking for your pound of flesh? Or do you go back into those contracts saying, I now have to continue to build that partnership in a downtime with these carriers, knowing that now it's a friendship, it's a partnership, I, I can be cruel. Or I can say, markets move up, markets move down. This is the time now when I try to find the best possible way to come out of this golden. And I think that's gonna be your best option. We want carriers to be profitable. We want carriers to make money on their business because we don't wanna be in a situation where there's fewer of them. You don't wanna hanja. No, you absolutely don't. We all suffered greatly when that happened. And when you have fewer choices, all it does is put carriers in a situation where it's supply and demand. They're gonna make more money on less opportunity. You don't want that. You want more carriers. You want diversity from what you can pick from. We want more diversity because it puts us in a position where we have more people to negotiate with. Don't do that to yourself. Uh, as shockingly tempting as it might be, given what we all just went through. Yeah, Le last question, fast forwarding a little bit. Mm -hmm. We're going into 2024. Uh, I feel like there's a lot more uh, consensus as to what 2024 may look like now than there was earlier in the year. Um, but there's a lot of major things to keep in mind. Obviously, you've got California clean air regulations, which could reduce the port and rail fleets in California by as much as 30 percent. You've got ILA, uh, uh, you know, labor disputes in the sense that their contract's not done. It's very um, it's, ve it's very unique for them to not be in a situation where they've created uh, confidence with the shipper. 
Um, and then you just have a, a whole supply chain that's still reacting to the tailspin that was the pandemic. What do you think 2024 brings? And specifically from a forwarder's perspective, what are some of the unique opportunities and challenges in 2024? For opportunities in the coming year, I think we're in an incredible position to be able to take lessons from the very recent past and apply them with our clients to prepare you for the next massive event. There's a chance here to learn about sustainability and, and, and stability in your supply chain that people still haven't done. What happens when you have a major cyber attack? What happens if we have geopolitical issues? What happens if there's currency problems? What happens if a, a major economy like China has a real meltdown because of their real estate issues? What happens if you have something akin to Brexit? Well, why aren't you thinking about that? Mm -hmm. And there are people you can reach out to from anyone from a Dre provider who can talk to you about the next big regulatory legislative issue. Prepare yourself, because we all are watching it, to economic folks inside of large freight forwarders who do value this type of information and are ready to share it with you. Why aren't you baking that into your discussions about your supply chain? The supply chain is best defined as purchase order through payment. It's not just the container moving from one place to another. Why aren't you thinking broadly in that way? So that's one way to look at it. Challenges without question. The idea that with all of the chaos that continues to happen around us, we just think of the next month, the next quarter, the next year. You should be considering the next three years, the next five years, and preparing your supply chain to deal with it. And we don't. We're a feast and famine business whether it's on the asset side, non-asset side, whether we're dealing with government entities, we are more than happy to take the money when it comes, spend it as quickly as it comes in, and then wonder what the hell went wrong when it all goes sideways. And I think that ultimately, we're gonna look back on this great opportunity we had over the, the past three years and wonder why we didn't invest better in infrastructure, whether it's the government or whether it's ourselves. And the companies that were smart with that money are going to find themselves in an absolutely incredible position to reap the rewards of it. Again, whether that's the importers and shippers and exporters themselves or whether it's the companies. So um, next three to five years, I think, are going to be defining on who has that insurmountable lead uh, financially. And I can't wait to watch and see what happens. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think we both agree that less volume is not a solution to congestion. No. And there's a lot of people that'll say, look, we fixed our problems, but all it has happened is the freight has gone away and we're gonna get ready for another Easter Sunday's worth of freight at some point in time. Yeah. There's always, uh, listen, I've been in the industry 10 years and every year I've had a once in a lifetime thing that's happened that's disrupted the supply chain, at least one, right? Yeah. So I, I think we would all agree that we need to build the supply chain for the amount of volume we want to move in the way we want to move it, as opposed to continuously trying to put this square peg in this round hole and say it functions. You know, they, uh, <laughs> there's nothing sexy about infrastructure bills. No one goes in front of their constituents and says, hey, everyone, I made the port better, or I fixed all these bridges, vote for me. That doesn't really move the needle on your, uh, uh, on your polls, and that's unfortunate, but it's really what we need right now. And it was only a year ago that you could turn on the nightly news and the major, the, the, the major channels couldn't talk enough about how our infrastructure was crumbling for transportation. Why is it we've forgotten so quickly? Yep. Uh, that needs to be part of, of how we consider what happens next. It needs to be part of how we think about the, the trillions of dollars that we spend, tax dollars that we spend. Um, but you and I can worry about that. But I don't think someone who's waiting in line at Whole Foods really puts a lot of brain power toward that. Yeah, well, it's going to be on folks like you, myself, and, and many others just to continue to beat the drum and to educate. Uh, really appreciate you of doing course. this. Uh, again, Weston Labar with People on the Move, Cargomatic Podcast with Pete Mento with DSV here live at the VMA 2023. Thanks for joining us, and uh, good luck with Dan Maffei. Uh, it's going to be great. Thank you much for having me. Thanks. All right. Thanks. Take care.